In this video, we're going to talk about the downfall of the Pokemon main series games and explain exactly what happened with some revolutionary new data and information. Make sure to stay to the end as it only gets crazier as we delve into this rabbit hole. After the disappointment that was Pokemon Sword and Shield, many fans were left asking what in the world happened to this franchise? Pokemon games used to be packed full of high quality content, so much so that Shigeki Morimoto, the director of Heart Gold and Soul Silver, for instance, said regarding those games, we've been greedy in the amount of gameplay elements we've squeezed in there. There's so much included that I even had colleagues saying to me, are you sure we should be going this far with a remake? In that sense, it's not simply a remake. I think it's more than that. We basically included all the game elements that had been in Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. It's as if we've just taken a selection of the best features of the series on the DS. Games like Heart Gold, Soul Silver, Platinum, Emerald, Black and White, and Black 2 and White 2 were polished games that absolutely were packed with content, whether you consider extra features, story, safari zones, battle frontiers, Pokemon World tournaments, etc. There was so much extra stuff packed into the games that it really felt like a complete experience with nearly endless amounts of things that you can do after you beat the main story and overall high quality development too. At some point though, this all changed. A broad consensus among Pokemon fans is that this change occurred with the introduction of X and Y, whose story was largely incomplete and the post-game content was nearly non-existent, followed by Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire where post-game potential was squandered with the devastating cut of the Battle Frontier and its replacement by, well, this. The strong majority of fans will tell you that X and Y is where the main series started going downhill in terms of quality with subsequent games like Sun and Moon, Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, and Sword and Shield doing quite a good job of substantiating this notion. A quick glance at the amount of content and the quality of the games prior to X and Y compared to those afterwards easily provides an objective case for this idea. Proving that has already been done elsewhere and is not the point of this video. No, instead we're going to explain why this downfall happened in the first place. I've spent a lot of time thinking about what exactly went wrong in the main series' life cycle and it wasn't until a couple days ago when it all clicked and I found something that I absolutely couldn't believe and that still shocks me when I think about it. What I did was I divided the lifespan of Pokemon into two eras. The one that people consider to be high quality or the golden age, Gen 1 through Gen 5, and Gen 6 through Gen 8, the downfall. Clearly there is a distinction in the quality of the games in these two eras, so I wanted to see if I could find any broad differences in development between the two. That way we could look for any commonalities. Then it occurred to me, let's chart all the release dates of the main series games, enhanced versions and sequels included. I then took the release dates and calculated the exact number of days that passed between each release. I then calculated the average amount of days between release for both the golden era and the downfall, and what I found was quite convincing. From Gen 6 through 8, the average number of days between releases was 415. From Gens 1 through 5, the average number of days between releases was... 542. Now, development can overlap, but it's safe to say that there were approximately 127 more days of development on average for the Golden Era games compared to the Downfall Era. That is actually insane and is so statistically significant it's not even funny since it accounts for 18 different releases. Another 31% of the Downfall Era game development time was spent on the average Golden Era game. Nearly a third more time. Just imagine a whole team of, let's say, 100 employees working across 127 days. Let's assume a 5-day, 40-hour work week, and when it comes to game development, trust me, it's way more than that, but again, we're gonna play devil's advocate here. That means that something like 360,000 less work hours were spent on each new release on average by the employees. 360,000 less hours of game production. Now some might argue, well, hey, hold on a minute, Gens 1 and Gen 2 weren't really golden era games, they had a lot of problems too, and that's definitely correct, although for the time, one could argue that they were incredible games. But hey, let's play devil's advocate again and accept this premise. Let's say we take Gens 3 through 5 only as the golden era. Even still, there's a difference of 415 days to 526. Almost the exact same scenario with a 27% difference. Another foreseeable counter-argument is, well, enhanced versions and sequels kind of mess this up since there's more releases and whatnot. Well then, let's take it generation by generation in terms of only using the first games to come out in each gen, such as Red and Blue, Gold and Silver, Ruby and Sapphire, etc. For the Downfall era, there have been 1,115 average days between new generation releases. For the Golden era, there were 1,329 absolutely unbelievable. An average difference of 214 more days or 19% more time in development per generation. 
What's absolutely incredible about this data is that it's almost directly proportional to how much quality and content has been missing. I'd say that 20 to 30% range is exactly right for Pokemon Black and White compared to X and Y, for instance. Now keep in mind that in terms of the complexity of the game development, the games have probably gotten harder to make by a factor of at least 10 in terms of higher quality music, animations, 3D modeling, dialogue, etc. Yet Game Freak's size as a company has not increased proportionally. In fact, judging by the credits of Ruby and Sapphire, not including translators, international employees, testers, etc., Game Freak has gone from around 80 employees in 2002 to only 143 in 2019, a period of 17 years. So that can't possibly account for the lower development time as the games got infinitely more complex to develop in addition to the 31% less time spent on them. In addition to this, there's also the issue of side games. Now, I've talked a bit about this before, but Game Freak has something called the Gear Project, which is used to develop games other than Pokemon, such as Harmonite, Pocket Card Jockey, Town, etc. I'll let Game Freak employee Inoue explain exactly why this is significant in his own words. There are two different production teams here, simply named Production Team 1 and Production Team 2. Team 1 is fully dedicated to the Gear Project, while Team 2 is for the Pokemon operation. What this means is Game Freak as a company is prioritizing Gear Project, which is production team number 1, more than Pokemon in general. We are always trying to create something that is equally exciting or more exciting than Pokemon. If that alone doesn't speak volumes, let me draw it out for you in terms of the two eras we've been talking about. In the Golden Era, Gens 1 through 5, Game Freak developed four other side games in a period of 16 years. In the Downfall Era, Game Freak developed seven other side games in seven years. When Pokemon was at its best, Game Freak was only creating one side game every four years on average, whereas when Pokemon has been at its worst, Game Freak has been developing an average of one side game per year, a 400% increase, including a fully HD Switch game called Town during Sword and Shield development, with a team that only has 143 employees in total. Game Freak is spending 31% less time on each Pokemon game and are pumping out 400% as many side games. Conversely, imagine 31% more time spent on each Pokemon game and four times less side games being developed. How great the Pokemon games would be. This is indisputably the reason Pokemon games have become so hollow and soulless. The math is plainly right there out in the open. So we've established why the main series games have declined in quality, but why has there been less time spent on each game? To answer that, we have to keep in mind that Game Freak is just one part of the Pokemon company. It has a one-third share in the company along with Nintendo and Creatures Inc., and represents way less than that in terms of revenue. In fact, the Pokemon company's all-time revenue chart leaked earlier this year, how convenient, and it paints a daunting picture. Out of the $103 billion the company has made, the video games only represent $19.5 billion of that, or just about 19%. And keep in mind that that's including all the spin-off games too, which Game Freak does not develop, meaning the main series games account for even less. Within the franchise, the main series games are merely the precursors to everything else that follows in a generation, and particularly the physical merchandise such as toys, plushes, trading cards, magazines, the manga, etc. Every new generation, the Pokemon company has a new influx of massive revenue because there are new characters, Pokemon, regions, etc. that excite consumers and encourage them to purchase merchandise, watch the anime, see movies, etc. Over 80% of the revenue comes from outside the main series games. The main series games are merely the catalysts that get the ball rolling. So imagine you're a company owner and you see a revenue chart that looks something like this, broadly speaking. The start of every new generation sees a peak in revenue, with of course a slow dip leading into the next generation. What's the natural solution here for more revenue? Well, create more peaks, of course. Have them closer together and more frequent. This increases what is called the revenue refresh rate of the company. Game Freak is also not a standard video game developer. It's beholden to the broader Pokemon company to align its releases correctly with the numerous other and more profitable aspects of the franchise. Let's head back to our debut generation game chart. Keep in mind that these games represent the start of a new generation. The time between them directly correlates with the time between generations. Between Gens 1 and 5, 1,329 days between each generation on average. Gens 6 through 8, 1,115 days between each generation. The generations are going by faster and faster. They're more rushed, and as a consequence, Game Freak is rushed. 
This was revealed to us when a recent leak showed that a game list included a pair of Kalos games that were supposed to come out after X and Y, but they got scrapped. It seems they didn't have time to complete them. Games are coming out faster and faster, and as we previously discussed, the generations are going by quicker and quicker, likely spurred on by the Pokemon Company higher-ups. Game Freak is not without blame, though. Their increasing prioritization of the side games and purposeful decision to keep the company small, as stated by Masuda, does not help the matter at all. Well, there we go, there's a summary of why Pokemon games have been lower quality since X and Y, directly when the community perceived it and aligning with the math precisely. Since that exact point, 31% less time has been spent on each game, 19% less time has been spent on each generation, and Game Freak has been focusing on four times as many side games in the process. What are your thoughts about this? Let me know in the comments, leave a like if you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time for some more Pokemon content.